Hi, this is Dr. Mercola in Bismarck, North Dakota with Regenerative Agriculture Pioneer Gabe Brown and we're here in one of his paddock fields where he's raising a cash crop and he's going to enlighten us as to what, what the process is all about. One of the problems I think we have in production agriculture today is that we've gone to all monocultures. You know, we grow corn or we grow wheat or we grow soybeans. But you look in nature, monocultures don't occur in nature. It's always diversity. So what I have here is one of my attempts on how do I get diversity into a cash crop system. So growing in this particular field, there's barley, oats, field peas, lentils, and I'm missing one, flax. That's the other one. So I have five different cash crops growing at the same time. What that allows me, some years then, one will outperform the other, but I can combine this and it's a diverse mix. Now, you would be able to separate those out if you wanted, but what we're going to do with them is this is going to be feed for our hogs and for our land hens. So we're producing a mixed, balanced diet, rations, so to speak, for them. And most all other producers of organic pastured poultry are not doing. You're one of the only ones, that maybe the only one at this time, who's actually growing the grain that they feed those animals. Th that's correct. We're trying to close the loop, so to speak. We're trying to produce all the feed, plus all the animals are born and raised on our operation. So we want that closed loop. That way we can tell our customers beyond a doubt that when that animal was born, how it was raised, what it had to eat. And we're doing the best job we can to ensure that they're getting a nutrient-dense product. And then uh, <clears throat> once this, these crops mature and you harvest them, what, what's the process after that? As soon as these crops are harvested, within the next couple of days after that, we'll be in here seeding another cash crop. Okay. This crop will be put in a bin and used as feed throughout the year, but then there will be a, a cover crop, excuse me, growing. We'll follow this cash crop with the cover crop. A lot of people think in our northern environment, oh, you can't do that, the, cash cr the cover crop's only gonna grow a couple inches tall and it's not worth the time or money. What they don't realize is how soil is formed. Mm -hmm. Take sunlight in a living plant. You have to have something growing as long as possible throughout the year. That's why all of our cropland acres will have not only a cash crop, but a cover crop growing on them every year. We're going to try and ensure there's a living root in the ground at all times to feed that biology, plus that plant with leaves to collect sunlight. And how long does it take for the plants to mature to the point of harvesting? Yeah, this particular cash crop was seeded about April 15th, mm -hmm. and we'll be combining it here in early August sometime. Okay. It, it'll be ready to go. Now, look at what we're doing also in these different species themselves, that the five species we have growing here. We have legumes and grasses. Well, the legume is here for a reason. Above every acre of land, there's approximately 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. I can't understand why any farmer would write a check for nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen, when all they have to do is grow legumes. Those legumes then, through the rhizobia in their roots, can take that atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into forms used by the plants. In turn then, the legumes, in this case the field peas and the lentils, are the rhizobia are fixing that nitrogen. The mycorrhizal fungi in the soil is transferring that nitrogen to the barley and oat crops. In turn, the barley and the oat crops are upbringing phosphorus. The mycorrhizal fungi is taking that phosphorus, feeding it to the legumes. That's how nature functions. That's why we need diversity. Unfortunately, the production model today is not allowing that to take place. And then at the same time, you're building soil rather than destroying yeah, it. Yeah, we're growing topsoil. You often hear soil scientists say, oh, it takes 500 years to grow an inch of topsoil. That's totally false. We can accelerate that. We can grow inches of topsoil in a decade yeah. if we use the proper, follow nature as the template, not just and any soil, but soil with high organic content. That's that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And your what's the average of your? Yeah, the average uh, organic matter on our operation is in the six to eight percent range. Okay. Yeah, on our on our 
perennial pastures were well over 8%. Yeah. It's about as good as it gets, right? Well, I, I asked a, a soil scientist, I said, to their best estimate, pre-European settlement, what was the organic matter levels in this area? And they said 7 to 8%. Yeah. So we're getting there. Mm -hmm. I think we have a long way to go, and I think we can go above and beyond that. Yeah, but, if you apply these principles. Yep. And so often in production agriculture today, all you hear is yield, yield, yield. Yield is everything. But I never hear them talking about profit, and I never hear them talking about what it's doing for the soils for the next generation. You know, I could be in a conventional mindset, tilling the soil, doing monocultures. I could live with that. But the question I have is, can my children and grandchildren live with that? No. 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 And then you look at the human health crisis we're having in this country. The nutrient densities of the products we're producing has decreased anywhere from 15 to 65 percent in the last 50 years. I think a large part of that is due to the decimation of our soil and that we don't have healthy soil that's functioning properly and supplying those nutrients to the plants. If we can do that, get a healthy functioning soil ecosystem, we're gonna, it's going to be able to positively affect human health also. Terrific.